Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to today's special roundtable on electronic warfare and electromagnetic spectrum superiority. As with any future-minded national security organization or research group, a Mitchell Institute understands the many challenges and opportunities that EW and EMS represent to our national security enterprise. We constantly talk about the importance of such things as spectrum superiority and interoperability, and those are all worthy goals. However, too often, the defense community and its thought pieces, op-eds, and war games tends to hand wave these critical elements as if they're already adequately in place. We assume that critical technologies meant to cleverly exploit the spectrum will work as advertised and that we'll have all the tools necessary to achieve desired mission effects. In reality, we all recognize that there's a lot of work to be done to make EMS superiority more than PowerPoint. With that in mind, today we brought together some of the key personalities working in the EW EMS superiority challenge to discuss what's being done to ensure that we put in place the strategy, doctrine, and capabilities that will be essential for mission success in future operating environments. With that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ken Dworkin, a good friend of mine and a former intelligence community senior executive, and now Booz Allen Hamilton's executive advisor for electronic combat. Ken was the mastermind responsible for organizing this conjunction of experts. So I'll let him introduce them to you. So over to you, Ken. Thanks, Dave, and happy Wednesday. Greetings, Air Force Association members, US government and military personnel, allied partners, EW and EMS operations professionals, colleagues, and friends. On behalf of myself and the other Knights of the EW EMS Superiority Roundtable, we are enthusiastic for this opportunity to provide a reintroduction to EW and EMS operations in the context of current and emerging policy, strategy, and doctrine. The objective of this session is to help establish a consistent foundation for discussing EW and MSO activities based on an improving appreciation for nuances in the definitions of and relationships between those disciplines. Even absent a perfect common lexicon, it is useful to promote a shared understanding to inform pursuit of advanced architectures and capabilities, as well as effective operational tactics, techniques, and procedures. Our panelists were specifically selected to span considerations of policy, strategy, doctrine, operations, architecture, technology, integration, and interoperability. We hope you enjoy and benefit from the roundtable. Next chart, please. It's not our intent to trace the history of incredibly well-admired challenges like EW and MSO, nor to debate the academic and programmatic merits of declaring the EMS a warfighting domain. We will leave those conversations for virtual happy hour. Instead, we will use the new 2020 DOD electromagnetic spectrum superiority, superiority strategy as a point of departure. That document addresses the quote, traditional functions of electromagnetic spectrum management and electromagnetic warfare integrated as electromagnetic spectrum operations, unquote. This is a practical and serviceable formulation that will allow the panelists maximum freedom of maneuver, so to speak, in their remarks. Importantly, the 2020 strategy also, quote, embraces the enterprise approach required to ensure EMS superiority by integrating efforts to enhance near-term and long-term EMS capabilities, activities, and operations, unquote. The panel is structured in a way that attests to the enterprise approach. Over time, numerous EW and EMS studies have been conducted and intervening strategies developed. While specific study details are not releasable in this open forum, all reinforce the 2015 Defense Science Board finding of major deficiencies and philosophically support critical new governance constructs like the EW Executive Committee and the MSO cross-functional team to oversee and drive mission transformation. Next chart, please. It's my privilege to introduce you to today's outstanding panel who are approached not only because they have principal mission responsibilities for EWMSO, but because they are gifted leaders 
who understand the interplay between strategy, architecture, and operations. Several are new to their positions, but based on their background, experience, and commitment to excellence, each is already engaged in implementation activities that substantively advance contemporary warfighting concepts, such as joint electromagnetic spectrum operations, multi-domain operations, and joint all-domain command and control. General Anne-Marie Anthony serves as the US STRATCOM Deputy Director for Joint EM Spectrum Operations, or GEMSO, overseeing the Joint EW Center and the JEPEC. General Anthony has an undergraduate degree in physics, plus extensive operational, technical, and program management experience in the military and in industry. Mr. Dave Tremper recently transitioned from DARPA to become EW Director on the acquisition and sustainment side of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense. In that role, he also serves as Executive Secretary for the EWXCOM. Colonel Dollar Bill Young was recently named Commander of the incipient 350th Spectrum Warfare Wing. Dollar brings considerable EW background as a former commander of the Air Force 53rd EW Group under the 53rd Wing at Eglin Air Force Base. He is a true innovator, deeply invested in future spectrum superiority from strategy to architecture to operations. Dr. Ilya Lipkin is the literal brains behind the sensor open systems architecture, a relatively new standard that nonetheless enjoys the by name imprimatur of a unique 2019 tri-service memo from the secretaries of the Air Force, Navy and Army, declaring that modular open systems approaches are a warfighting imperative. Last but far from least, General Dave Abba is also a veteran of the 53rd Wing, commanding that organization through June 2019. He is currently director of the F-35 Integration Office, and in that capacity, advises the Secretary of the Air Force and the Air Force Chief of Staff on the multi-billion dollar F-35 Lightning II program. Each panelist will make a few opening remarks, after which General Deptula will open up the virtual floor for your questions. With that, let's go to the next chart and hear from General Anthony. Good morning. It's great to be here. I'm Brigadier General Anne-Marie Anthony, and as mentioned previously, I am the Deputy Director of Joint Electromagnetic Spectrum Operations at United States Strategic Command. As many of you are aware, Strategic Command has a UCP responsibilities for GEMSO, which means we are the support mechanism for joint planning, training, and advocacy. And one thing that I have noticed when I, since coming into this job is really the changing paradigm about how we are thinking about the EMS. We are all in the game and we just don't know it yet. In the past, we just expected the spectrum to be available and to work. But as everyone here is aware, the electromagnetic operational environment is becoming more complex. You know, think contested, congested and constrained. For example, perhaps a few years back, if you went to Kia radio and it didn't work, you may think, well, I guess the equipment doesn't work. But nowadays, as part of that changing paradigm, we're starting to think, is it the equipment doesn't work? Is there interference some, someplace else because of the congested environment? Or is it something else? And so we really have to expand the way that we are thinking about electromagnetic spectrum operations and inculcate everyone to the importance of MSO. And part of that changing paradigm is also recognizing that our EMS savvy workforce has really atrophied to unacceptable levels. We have a loss of EMSO expertise and capabilities over the past 20 to 30 years. And in order for us to take a more broader view of the electromagnetic operating environment, we need to smartly rebuild a cadre that can focus on EMS specific challenges and tasks. I do believe that the services understand this and are beginning to address the shortfalls. And now we as the joint force need to follow suit. Now the Department of Defense does see this changing paradigm and recognizes the need to align EMS resources, capabilities and act activities across the Department of Defense. And as mentioned earlier, the Secretary of Defense signed out the DOD EMS superiority strategy. And in this strategy, there are five interdependent goals that when realized will allow us to have freedom of action in the electromagnetic spectrum at a time and a place in our choosing. These five goals are to develop superior EMS capabilities, evolve to an agile, fully integrated EMS infrastructure, pursue total force readiness, 
secure those enduring partnerships for EMS advantage and establish effective EMS government to support strategic and operational objectives. And it's great that we have a strategy and it's great that we have goals, but we need a way to achieve those goals, see those goals come to fruition. And that is why the OSD MSO cross-functional team is leading an implementation plan development and the STRATCOM MSO professionals are heavily involved in all aspects of plan development from how do we grow a ro robust workforce what type of tools do we develop to support the warfighter? And how do we promote those policies that support DOD EMS capabilities? And now I'd like to narrow my remarks and talk about some activities specific to United States Strategic Command. I like to refer to this as the Trinity of Joint EMS Support, the GEMSOC, EMBM, and GEMSIAF. The GEMSOC, or the Joint Electromagnetic Spectrum, Spectrum operation cell, that's the people, the people at the joint level that will do the mission. And it's the goal to have a gem socket each of the combatant commands. So the STRATCOM EMS professionals have been working on manpower studies and resourcing actions to staff the combatant commands with their gem sock. Now it's great that we have people, but people need a tool to be able to do their job. And that's where EMBM, or the Electromagnetic Battle Management Tool, comes to play. This is the tool that the GEMSOC will use to do joint planning, situational awareness, and command and control. We are using a rapid software acquisition process to develop this tool, so think minimum viable product releases. It will feature cloud-based data tools and machine-to-machine -machine and human-to-machine interaction. We are at the very beginning of this effort and it is very exciting. STRATCOM will be the operational sponsor and DISA is the program manager for this effort. So we have the people and we have the tool and the final part that we need is the data. And that's where GEMSIAF comes into play. GEMSIAF is Joint EMS Information Analysis and Fusion Effort. It is a data integration effort of EMS capabilities and we are building this using Amazon Web Services. This effort is being accomplished by STRATCOM's Joint Electromagnetic Warfare Center in San Antonio. Overall, I can say this is a very exciting time to be part of the Electromagnetic Spectrum Operations uh, Group. It's neat to see the emphasis that is starting to be placed on this very important maneuver space. And now I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Dave Tremper, who will describe OSD ANS's EW area of emphasis. Thank you. Great, many thanks, General Anthony. So I'm Dave Tremper from, from OSD. I have a background predominantly in science and technology, and, and I've been bringing that background to the forefront here as we, as we do acquisition and sustainment strategies for EW. So it, it's really important, the message that, that General Anthony just delivered about the department's emphasis on EMS and EMS strategies. And, and I have some experience in, in the challenges of that because I come from an EW community where we've had uh, spectrum conflicts with comms users and radar users and, and, and other spectrum using systems. And because historically we have not taken a holistic approach to how we manage spectrum using systems tactically in that way, we end up in this, this, these cylinders of excellence where the EW community is trying to accommodate the radio community or vice versa or there's finger pointing about who's responsible for different spectrum issues, but there has never been historically a holistic view of that to, to deconflict it on the fly. And so, so that the department is starting to take the strategy of how do we holistically approach EMS superiority and, and how do we address um, this, this adaptive uh, dynamic use of the spectrum by all spectrum using systems is, is critically important to future operations. So as we look at the different EW areas of emphasis that we've been pushing within ANS, one of the big ones is creating EW investment efficiency. And, and I think that this, this will spread from EW across to other EMS spectrum using systems. And the key to this here is that when you build an EW system, you're not building an airplane, or you're not building a submarine, or you're not building a ground system. You're building an, a, a system that's capable of using the RF spectrum in particular ways. And so when you start to break that down, you realize that there is a lot of commonality across different platforms in the EW technologies they need. 
Right? And so when you start to look at it that way, you realize that I can leverage EW investment that I'm making in one platform towards another platform. And historically, when we measure EW uh, emphasis within the department, we say, what is the bottom line? How much have we been spending on EW and has that changed? Has it increased or decreased? And we have historically used that as a metric to determine whether we're emphasizing EW. So one of the shifts in perspective that we're taking within ANS is we need to be uh, paying attention to EW investment efficiency, probably more so than bottom line. And, and the reason is that if I can make $1 worth of EW investment and it impacts my four services, I've effectively gotten $4 worth of efficiency out of that $1 worth investment. So if I'm measuring bottom line, that's a useful metric. If I'm measuring efficiency, that metric starts to increase or decrease, and, and I, where I really want is I want that efficiency to increase so that I'm leveraging across my different spectrum or EW using systems. So one of the keys to that is software-defined and multifunction systems. So software-defined systems allows me effectively to change what the, what the application of that EW technology is. So it may be pursuing a submarine operation one day, but in another system, it's on a tactical aircraft, I can change the software and it's actually now performing uh, a tactical error-based EW performance. And we span that to multifunction because that's now when we say the capability to bring other RF using capabilities within to a common box. And, and that approach, different services are taking that multifunction RF systems approach. There is an acquisition impact on that that we're currently trying to assess because if I no longer need to build a radio box or I no longer need to build a SIGINT box or I no longer need to build an EW box, I can build one box and have all of those applications applied to that single box. Well, that has an impact on the way we currently do system acquisition across our RF using systems. So we're look, taking a close look at that and attempting to determine what is the, 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 the acquisition impact of those approaches. So software-defined and multifunction systems allow you to accelerate EW capabilities. Now no longer do I recognize a threat and then I have to turn around and build an acquisition program and maybe 10 to 15 years from now I'll have a box that will give me the capability to deal with that threat. But I can, I can turn the software, I can sling some new code, and I can put it into that box and have that new capability as fast as the threat has shown up. So we're really trying to get to that area. We're also trying to distribute a network and coordinate our sensors because no longer is it a one versus one fight, it's a many on many. And the, the better we can do at moving data between systems, correlating that data and allowing a, a, battle, a full battle space awareness picture across all of my tactical systems, the better off all of our tactical systems are going to be for dealing with that problem. Historically, you pay a lot of attention to radio frequency capabilities. Electro-optics and infrared, we also do. But we're seeing a shift kind of in the threat picture on how radio frequency and electro-optic and infrared systems are out there. So now we're trying to really go wholehearted after the entire spectrum. How do we get RF through EO, through IR capabilities, all fused together and all capable together? We're looking at how do we synergize across our information operations, our intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, and our electronic warfare operations. And many people say, well, electronic warfare, that's part of IO, and, and it's actually not. The where in the phase of the fight those different systems show up uh, dictates what they really are. But we can get, we can fuse across those different operations, and we can have tactical EW systems that are, that are informed dynamically by ISR capabilities and IO operations that are coordinated with electronic warfare operations. And so synergizing across those different mission areas provides us an a, a, uh, enhanced capability. So we talked about spectrum superiority within EMSO. One of the key pieces to this that I think we are all taking a close look at is, is electronic protection. And, and if you look in a textbook, and you look up the definition of electronic warfare, you will see that electronic warfare is defined as electronic attack, electronic support, and electronic protection. But if you look at how we develop systems, we develop electronic attack and we develop electronic support systems under EW. We don't develop electronic protection systems under EW. Electronic protection is built as features into spectrum dependent systems. So a radio will have electronic protection features, a, a radar will have electronic protection features, a PNT or position navigating and timing system will have electronic protection features. But the onus is on those stoved pipe program developers to determine how best to implement their EP. So when you think of it that way, we really have to take a, a closer look at collectively about how we practice and manage EP so that in pursuit of the CFT's EMS superiority strategy, 
all spectrum using systems are in a position to, fa to facilitate and support that EMS superiority vision. And that with all of that, with the technologies and the policies and, and co connecting across the cylinders of excellence, we need to understand how do we train, right? It's one thing to have the technologies to do it. It's a complete different thing to have the operators that are sitting in the seat on the cutting edge or on the, the tip of the spear who understand how to use the technology and understand the implications of the technology. So we're pushing hard within the department for how do we do EMS training? How do we do EW training? Do we have the ranges to support the, the levels of training that we need? And that's a question that cuts from the science and technology community all the way across to the pre-deployment community. And we have to have, we have to bridge those across all of those communities to make sure that we have a seamless strategy. So as we continue pushing forward, it, it's a lot of the information and, and we, we're looking for the for industry to come to us and say, hey, these are things that we're working on. These are the multifunction techniques that we're considering. These are the software defined approaches that we're thinking about. This is how we're doing electronic protection. This is how we're doing spectrum deconfliction across spectrum using systems. Those are all high interest items in the direction that acquisition and sustainment are pushing now. So with that, I'm going to hand this off now to, to Colonel Young, to Dollar Young, uh, for his part of this talk. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's indeed a, a pleasure uh, to get the opportunity to be part of this uh, panel of leaders and thinkers, uh, but also to address all of you all. I believe it was Winston Churchill that said, uh, we're out of money, so we have to think. And what I would argue is that really the electromagnetic spectrum is a unique opportunity space should we choose uh, to continue to uh, take the competition there that offers us the opportunity for a sustainable, but more importantly, potentially affordable competitive advantage. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, it offers us the opportunity, as Mr. Uh, Tremper was discussing earlier, to get away from a focus of platforms exclusively and instead focus on our ability to develop and rapidly field software defined capabilities that allow us to use our platforms in very, very different ways. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. And I'll draw upon uh, John Boyd. Uh, he said, he, he proposed a simple thought experiment. And he said, uh, think about a bicycle and hold that in your mind. Uh, now think about a motorboat. Again, hold that in your mind. Now, while you've got the motor uh, motorboat and the bicycle, now add to that a toy, uh, toy tank uh, with rubber treads on it uh, and a skier on a ski slope. And he said, while you're holding those individual pieces, now I want you to break them all apart. And from the bicycle, I want you to keep the handlebars. From the motorboat, I want you to keep the engine. From the toy tank, I want you to keep just the treads. And from the skier, I just want you to keep the ski blades. And what I want you to do is compose that into something that's actually useful to solve a problem. And what do you get? Next chart, please. You get a snowmobile. And so to me, that is really at the heart of this advantage that we find ourselves uh, positioning to be able to exploit. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, uh, in the area of, co uh, of competition, it was Boyd who also said that basically winners are folks that can build and control snowmobiles. Losers are those that can't. So the idea is that we can use the electromagnetic spectrum as the, uh, as the connective tissue to look beyond our platforms and leverage the capabilities that are nascent within the skin. So let's, let's bring that forward. And now, same experiment, and I want you to think about a fourth gen fighter, a fifth gen fighter, a sixth gen fighter, a satellite, and imagine those, and now being able to, at the pointy edge, get rid of and break apart, break those things apart and be able to connect all the various cap uh, capabilities uh, that are on the various platforms into a composite system that allows our warfighters at the edge to both solve problems, but also to pose problems to our adversaries. And oh, by the way, 
that's we're going to do something completely different tomorrow and the day after that something completely different and the day after that something completely different the power of that competitive advantage is not merely in the technology but rather it's in the innovation of our war fighters to when posed with the problem and given commander's intent to then be able to look at what's available to them rapidly put that together into a new into a new tool set and then go take the fight to the adversary that's what we're talking about here that is the powerful advantage that i believe the initiatives that you're hearing on this panel will open up for us uh, however the, the basic buy-in to get to that really is the concept of open systems architecture and with that i'll turn it over to dr Ilya lipkin who will discuss that in more detail i look forward to your questions Thank you, Dollar. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, open architectures in general and the uh, Central System Architecture Program in particular. We all recognize the growing importance of open architecture standards for ensuring that our systems, capabilities, components, and technologies can talk to one another, work together and as seamlessly as possible to achieve uh, composability and reduce sustainment costs. Uh, this chart summarizes key SOSA benefits while the SOSA standard applies to sensors, components, that sense and produce data about what they sense. It has also combines multiple EMS phenomenologies, including radar, SIGIN, electronic warfare, communications, and AOIR, using modules with well-defined hardware, software, electrical mechanical interfaces. We did pick those five phenomenologies for a reason, as those are the ones that are most significant to our services. Uh, let's review some of the uh, benefits for the government and why are we uh, doing this. A lot of uh, capability rework happens due to uh, poorly articulated requirements, incomplete or changing requirements. Uh, we're developing products that promote procurement efficiencies by learning lessons from other open standards programs. For example, uh, boilerplate contract requirements language accelerates RFP development. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to craft the language for vendors to propose the right technologies to us. And having a standard set of contractual requirements allows us to streamline this process. Um, we also support faster acquisition timelines across all phases of procurement, not just RFP. By uh, trying to develop a standards approach that encourages reuse and limits the need for uh, NRE, non-recurrent engineering. Our primary goal of SOSA is to bring new capabilities to the warfighter faster through streamlined procurement and rapid capability reconfiguration on the flight line using interchangeable sensor components. Another way to think about it is we're trying to standardize the key widget interfaces so we can put them together faster. Uh, as somebody said, you can't make a, a baby in nine months if you hire uh, nine women. So the same thing applies to technology. We can't uh, make the technology go faster, but we can reuse as much as possible if somebody else already invested in it. So the goal of SOSA is to allow those widgets to be reused faster. Uh, we also sustain our military platform well beyond the original design date. For example, U2 was designed in 1950s. Maintaining operational readiness and creating a pathway for modern technology insertions are a major challenge. SOSA improves sustainment efficiencies and enables upgradability using standardized components, interfaces, and consistent process and chain specifications. Composable mission capabilities have been the holy grail of DOD and plug and play interoperability is a uh, foundational aspiration. In addition, SOSA has developed an approach for creating multi-in capabilities, such as SIG and SAW, EOIR, radar, comms, SIG and SAW, radar, and so forth. We have successfully demonstrated recently SIG and SAW uh, phenomenologies working together in one box, uh, similar to what Mr. Trumper alluded earlier. We are working to add uh, EEW, and comms later to the exact same box as part of the SOSA prototype experiments. We increased agility at the tactical age by allowing faster reconfiguration of the sensor systems in response to changing battle space environment. Now, why would industry invest in the open standards such as SOSA? Well, it reduces industry risk using well-defined interface standards that clarify engineering design and conformance demonstration. Uh, this serves to encapsulate novel commercial intellectual property into standardized boxes uh, that we can uh, reuse across uh, multiple programs. One of the major primes has been able to compile. One of the major primes is actually reuse that idea uh, to create a proposal that uh, they were able to successfully propose to multiple vendors, 
uh, thereby saving the cost and proposal prep, uh, leveraging SOSA technologies. Uh, other uh, allow um, to use our um, standard to control development cost using an app store type model to quickly develop or modify composable sensor systems. This approach allows industry more freedom to invest in innovative technologies because well-defined interfaces and data standards allow plug and play compatibility. SOSA also promotes rapid integration and building innovative capabilities uh, with effective modular solution that can be repurposed with little modifications. For example, uh, there is very little difference in the rate of design between Air Force, Army, and the Navy because physics are the same. Uh, the biggest challenge is the interfaces and how do we manage and control them. So with the standard interfaces, we uh, can actually reuse uh, with a lot more ease between the, our services, the same greater technologies. Uh, we're also leveraging AI ML software and advanced model-based system engineering concepts such as digital engineering uh, to develop social technical standards. Um, basically, we're paving the way for broader, more reliable sense of system industrial base by creating strategic sourcing ecosystem that lower the bar for entry to small businesses as well as non-traditional businesses to produce standardized components. For example, uh, one of the vendors uh, was not able to deliver me uh, a product X. I was able to, within three hours, find an alternative product Y from a different vendor that was basically plug and play. Um, this literally allowed me to pivot within three hours. Uh, the SOSA standard is the uh, product of coalition of the willing. And as a result, SOSA uh, is based on uh, volunteers and uh, volunteer organizations. At this moment, we have about 100 volunteer organizations who have been helping us to develop SOSA technical standard. Uh, part of the technical standard is conformance. And uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, creating a good conformance strategy and methodology good contracting language that will increase sensor system procurement efficiencies. Uh, without the conformance process in place, it is uh, difficult for us to determine which apps in the app stores are good and which apps in the app stores are bad. Using the conformance methodology allows us to certify and guarantee that the apps are good. Um, the consortium currently includes DOD and military services, as well as uh, major primes, second and third tier suppliers, and a little bit of academia. Uh, the SOSA standard is advanced enough to refine um, our standards to support what we currently need today. And uh, it has a lightweight governance model that allows us to achieve consensus across our user base uh, for buy-in uh, for everybody to invest. SOSA is not free. Uh, it is supported by investment from all the SOSA members. This is because you have to have skin in a game for it to be successful. Um, perhaps the most important principle of underpinning SOS is that it aspires to be a standard of standards. That is, we're looking to achieve uniquely high level of interoperability and reuse by leveraging related open architecture standards, such as Red Hawk TOA, CMOS host OMS and Corps. Uh, there's also an NDIA language, an FI21 draft, that um, encourages SOS uh, leveraging and reuse by the DOD. Finally, for our international partners, SOS technical standard is a distribution aid document. Uh, however, development of the standard is restricted to US participants only, but the end product is freely available through the open group. Uh, you can download Social Technical Standard for free. Uh, with that, it's my honor to introduce our cleanup hitter, Brigadier General Dave Abba. One more okay. time, Daniel. There you go. Thank you, Ilya. Really appreciate the introduction, and thanks to Ken and uh, General Deptool and Mitchell for hosting this event. It's a pleasure to be on the panel again with uh, such a distinguished group of electromagnetic spectrum professionals. Um, my overarching thesis uh, for today is, is fairly simple and straightforward, and that's that the F-35, I would argue, uh, was well ahead of its time with respect to EMS operations, uh, because simply the, the management uh, the support in the electronic warfare elements of this airplane are foundational to how we operate the airplane. Um, and if you think about that quote that's on the screen there that's attributed to General Goldfein from 2018, that the F-35 is, is a computer that happens to fly. And that really captures the essence of kind of where I'm going with this. Beyond the stealth attributes of the airplane, one of the key distinguishing features between fifth generation and fourth generation systems uh, is the, the sensor fusion that, uh, that takes place. Uh, when General Deptool and I grew up flying F-15s, uh, the mechanics of how the radar operated in the airplane were hardwired into, that, uh, into the radar uh, operational flight program. We had a radar control panel over on the left side of the cockpit that allowed us to 
select how many bars or the azimuth uh, of the, the radar sweep that we wanted to select. Uh, but really, there wasn't a whole lot of other functionality that was accessible to us. And beyond that, there really wasn't any interplay between the functionality of the radar and the radar warning receiver uh, that was in the airplane, other than notching out some frequencies that the radar warning receiver didn't want to listen to. Uh, otherwise, it would have been deafened by the, by the radar. I contrast that with the way that the F-35 operates, right? The, the, um, the electronic warfare elements and the software elements of the airplane um, that drive the weapon system functionality are truly integrated uh, together. Uh, the mission data files that drive the, the, uh, the F-35 um, control not only the, the analog to the radar warning receiver, but they also happen to control all the offensive and defensive um, and passive and active uh, sensor scan schedules uh, on the airplane. Uh, so the F-35 is itself a vast consumer of uh, huge amounts of electronic uh, or electromagnetic support information. Uh, but then we incorporate that into a holistic fused understanding of the battle space as the airplane interprets uh, its, uh, the operating environment within which it, uh, it finds itself. So it's a really complicated uh, uh, it, um, composition of the airplane that can be difficult to describe unless you've lived within that fifth generation environment. Uh, so what, what I'll do here is just pivot briefly to what Ilya was just talking about. And that's that if we get the open mission systems and the sensor open system architecture stuff right, we can allow the, the software and the rapid recomposability issues that Dollar was talking about uh, to retain a competitive air uh, advantage for our warfighters, uh, even within the tightly coupled competitive space that we find ourselves in uh, with our key competitors that are out there. And ultimately, what that drives us to is an appreciation for the interoperability that the airplane uh, affords. And really what I'm getting at there is, is as the airplane has the tremendous ability to sense the environment within which it's operating, it's essential if we have international partnerships or other joint players um, that are operating together within F-35s, that the two airplanes or multiple sets of airplanes sense the same threats in the same way, identify them the same way, and then subsequently share that data uh, in a common sense uh, across that uh, JADC2 sort of an architecture uh, that we're all driving forward uh, uh, in the next coming years. There are a number of challenges uh, that are uh, essential for us to overcome in order to be uh, able to um, really maximize the utility of the weapon system as it's been designed. And what I've got displayed on the slide are often there are different sets of perspectives. The electronic warfare community tends to have one set of perspectives about the environment and, and how we operate. The acquisition community sometimes has another and the operational community has another. Those differences in perspective translate to risk. And the two that I'm primarily concerned about are mission risk and risk to our operators there. And so we think about how you know, this, this uh, 2020 um, uh, EMS superiority strategy document plays out, which I think it's a, it's a great document, does a phenomenal job of, of framing the, the challenge uh, we've got some bridges that we have to, uh, uh, some gaps that we have to bridge in, in understanding across the community. Because if we have an F-35 uh, flight lead who's getting ready to go out and do a suppression or a destruction of enemy air defenses mission, uh, frankly, uh, he or she is not particularly interested in, in, the, uh, in, in subdividing that mission set up. There's a find and fix element of the target set that that pilot or that flight is going to go after. Uh, and then in the prosecution of that, uh, there are going to be electronic attack elements. So how did, well, I think one of the key challenges here from a policy and a doctrine and a training and education perspective is how do we take all the goodness that comes out of that uh, EMS uh, superiority strategy and ensure that we promulgate that across the, uh, all the rest of the domains um, as we've talked about. Another key thing that we have to do better at is we must, must get faster at uh, electronic warfare uh, reprogramming. And uh, just to be perfectly clear, it's the threat that defines the speed of relevance uh, in this domain. And the key challenges that we face here are sharing information, uh, both intelligence and operational data sharing. Uh, the barriers that we have to break down uh, internally tend to reside within security and, and classification bounds. So we've got to find ways to bridge those gaps uh, effectively. But then we've also got to do that with our allies and partners. We have to be willing to share the data sets that, uh, that allow the airplane to be um, remarkably effective as well as ingest data uh, from various users in order to continue to accelerate the, uh, 
the viability of the, the EMS and, and the kinetic kill chains uh, that reside within the airplane. The last thing I want to talk about, and I think the strategy does a great job of framing this challenge, uh, is that uh, this long period that we've been in of SIGINT and electronic uh, support um, uh, dominated kill chains that were effectively uncontested is, is rapidly coming to an end, uh, and this is getting significantly harder. Uh, I think the days of having unambiguous um, combat identifications that are driven by key radio frequency parametrics are fading. Uh, some of the software defined systems that uh, Mr. Tremper was talking about uh, allow um, uh, various um, platforms and, and electronic warfare components to look like other folks, and they are rapidly software reprogrammable. And then that is only going to get worse as we continue to share more and more of the spectrum with commercial users. So we're going to have a lot more commingling of, uh, of capabilities out there that we're going to have to, to sort through. That said, I think the, the strategy does a great job of uh, detailing some of the requirements and the enhancements that we have to make, particularly with respect to the infrastructure in the characterization of the uh, operating environment. Uh, and that's going to be tough because as the uh, electromagnetic operating environment gets more and more complicated, system storage and computing power limitations, whether we're talking within the big EMS uh, architecture or out on the edge in platforms like F-35 will be limiting factors for us. Um, but if we get this right and we can rapidly reconfigure hardware and software on the edge, we'll be able to continue to create uh, dilemmas for our warfighters. Uh, so with that, I uh, look forward to your questions at the end, but for now, let's uh, go to the next slide and I'll turn it over to Dave Tremper again. Awesome. Thanks, General Ava. So, so we can sit on this panel and we can talk about all of our, our various uh, DOD EW pushes and our EMS superiority pushes, but, but I have to highlight that, that, that we can only do so much through the department in spreading the word and planting the seeds uh, with the technology experts and the scientists out there to really think hard about the problem. And, and the more that we think hard about that problem and, and the more that, that we can effectively crowdsource solutions for EMS operations, the better. And so in that regard, we have to, places like the Mitchell Institute, many thanks for setting up this discussion so that we can spread that word. The Association of Old Crows has always been a, a valuable asset for bringing in the technologists, sharing with industry, getting DOD and industry talking together and solving problems collectively. And that's been, that's been invaluable for many years. The MSO CFT has been doing God's work in understanding how do we get EMS superiority, creating that EMS superiority strategy that sets the tone for how do we, how do we build our EMS systems of the future and how do we get adaptive and dynamic and agility across all spectrum operations. And in support of that, places like the Hudson Institute that, that provide assessment on EW capabilities and RVJ Institute, who I've had some great conversations with about uh, theoretical definition of EW and how electronic protection in particular is actual, actually carried out within DOD management have been enlightening, I think, on both sides about how do we get after EMS superiority. And the RAND Corporation as well, another institute that's fantastic about spreading the word and helping, helping the DOD plant the seed on how do we get better in EW and how do we continue to evolve in our EMS superiority uh, capabilities. So with that, I will hand it back to General Deptula. Thanks, Dave, for those comments. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank all of you for your valuable perspectives uh, on the topic uh, today. Um, I'd like to especially thank Ken Dworkin uh, one more time for uh, catalyzing uh, this timely discussion. And now what we're going to do is uh, turn this over to the audience for some uh, Q&A. Um, if you'd like to participate, either submit your question, as many of you already have, using the Q&A tool, um, or tap the raise hand uh, icon. Uh, and if you do that, uh, when I call on you, please unmute your mic, um, state where, who you are, and ask your question. Uh, and if you can, make it to direct to one of our speakers. Now, we've already got a great set of questions here uh, on, uh, on text, uh, but let me kick it off with uh, one uh, that kind of will tee up some of the other questions that'll follow on. Um, and, and so with that, um, I guess I'd like to ask the panel writ large, whoever has the insight, What's the status of recent discussions on establishing an undersecretary of defense for information? Uh, uh, th that position uh, that would have oversight of DOD's uh, IW portfolio, if you will, overseeing strategies, policies, acquisition, and budget. 
uh, that would include the department's cyber uh, MSO and uh, influence ops portfolios. Uh, it seems to me like this would be a great step and something that's uh, long overdue. Uh, any insights that the panel can provide on that? So this is Dave Tremper. I, I think that, uh, so that, that topic came through the EWXCOM and there's been discussions about that. And the, the, effectively the strategy that resulted for doing that oversight uh, was handed to, the, to uh, the chief information officer, so C, OSD or DOD CIO. So within CIO has been stood up an SES position for EMS, and within that SES position, EMS, is, it's expected that, that the MSO um, guidance will reside uh, for future MSO capabilities. Okay, well, look, thanks for that insight. I guess um, the point that, uh, and I'll focus this on the Air Force, uh, but the point is we need to assemble a concerted approach to achieve information superiority writ large. Um, I think with respect to the Air Force, they took a step in this regard by standing up 16th Air Force, uh, recombining ISR and cyber to the way that they were before they were split apart in 2009. Um, all of us buy into the fact that information superiority is the key to winning future conflict. Uh, and um, I would say from an Air Force perspective, the sooner it stands up an information warfare major command that integrates the efforts uh, and the effects of IW, ISR, cyber and EW, uh, the quicker it'll be able to adopt to the information age. And it would be nice to see the Department of Defense uh, do something at a more macro level. So with that as sort of a front piece, um, let me turn to uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Otis Winkler, many of you know um, Otis from the Senate Armed Services Committee staff. And he would like to ask the panel, based on the Senate NDAA this year, which directs the movement of all MSO efforts in the department to a single entity, where is the right place for the centralized location or should it be separated? So kind of open to the panel, but uh, uh, any responses? So, so this is Dave Tremper again. I, I, I would, I would love to have an offline conversation about that, but, but where we are now, I think, is, is that discussion is happening at, at three or four levels above my head. <laughs> so, so for me to, to answer, it would probably be not appropriate. Um, as you, as you point out, that the EMSO, their EMS efforts are happening. They're, they're distributed, and, and so. So how do we collectively manage those efforts? Do we consolidate? Do we keep it distributed with a, essentially a single entity that oversees um, or ring that rules them all type of approach? I, I, don't, know, I don't know the answer to that. that that's that's going to be a decision that's made at a, at a much higher level than I think any of us are able to answer. Okay. Um, uh, I was going to turn next to a question that... Uh... Former Air Combat Command Commander General Ron Keyes had put up there, but sir, it looks like you pulled it down. So I'm going to ask a separate one so that you can put the original one back up if you want. This one's from uh, Victoria uh, Meralda. Uh, good morning, all. Thanks for having the panel. Having served on joint jamming and mitigation, JT&E and Joint Space Control Ops teams uh, years ago in PACOM and uh, STRATCOM, I still see significant seams as in previous years between mission areas and services, uh, particularly in capability development and architectural integration. How are emerging EW tools and capabilities being integrated and designed from cradle to birth to interoperate with their spectral cohabitator missions, um, such as space and cyber, to ensure sensor integration to rapidly and uh, ACU detect, protect, defend assets and missions across all domains. Shouldn't all spectral contributors requiring coordination of effects, deconfliction, be designed under one UCP authority versus current authorities in funding being slit, uh, split across STRATCOM, CYBERCOM, SPACECOM, and the services that has left us with disparate systems and capabilities? How do we get our arms around without aligning capability development? Which again is back to this theme of, uh, we got some great ideas, but organizationally, um, we've split this up so much that we are, are sub-optimizing potential. And this becomes more and more important 
uh, in a resource constrained environment. So again, open for the panel, but a great question, Victoria. So uh, this is uh, Brigadier General Anthony. And um, you know, one way that we look at the electromagnetic spectrum is we look at it as a maneuver space that touches all domains. So space uses uh, EMS, cyber uses EMS, the air component uses EMS, the land component, the naval component, everybody uses this particular maneuver space. So I personally get hesitant when I hear EMS, space, and cyber needing to be put together because there are other domains that use the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, you've got your army folks with their radios on the ground that we also have to take into consideration. Um, so while I don't know what the exact, and, and I, I could not answer this, what the exact perfect way for everything to be organized, I think the efforts in the DOD EMS superiority strategy and the implementation plan as we move forward to realizing those goals, I think that natural fit is going to present itself. And, and the cross-functional team, the MSO cross-functional team really is a cross-functional team with members from the combatant commands, OSD, the services. So I believe we're on the right path to be able to smartly answer that question. Over. Okay, well, that's fair. Um, back to General Keyes. He assures me he didn't remove anything, but I can't find his original question. But there's another point that he made up here uh, that basically is a statement that there has to be a move to unity of effort, or we're going to continue to fritter away money and talent on boutique projects within those silos of excellence. Everyone believes in unity of command as long as they are the unity. Uh, and I think that uh, kind of hits on um, what we've, uh, uh, what we've uh, talked about. Oh, here it is. Here's the original, uh, again, from General Keyes. I don't see anything that gets it coordinating, driving the EMS sphere to move faster. The problem is less spectrum deconfliction innovation than it is program PIM platform coordination and decision space. There's no one in charge that really can make anyone do anything or stop doing something. I think we focus too much on the technology and buzz phrases and too little on processes. SOSA doesn't do anything to combat the not invented here syndrome or speeding up the government decision direction bureaucracy or combating the blocking hindrance effect of programs or record to new ideas. So um, perhaps less than a question, uh, but a statement that I think um, summarizes uh, the, this interest area from a variety of folks on, uh, on, on organization. And I think the general answer that I've heard from the panel members so far is, yeah, we got it. The department's working on it. Um, but by golly, we shouldn't bury it under three layers of bureaucracy somewhere uh, on the OSD staff. General Deptula, can I just take a shot at that? I, I'd sure. like to offer a, uh, a positive note and, and a concrete thing that, uh, that the Air Force is doing. And it's, the, it's standing up the 350th Spectrum Warfare Wing. Uh, and General Key's point is, is very well taken. And that's why I believe uh, now retired General Holmes uh, the most recent uh, commander of Air Combat Command uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, General Wilson took the bold move of establishing this new operationally focused organization that could actually begin to get after this software defined capability. And so uh, if you imagine a world where everything is, is increasingly a software defined radio or a reprogrammable multifunction array, and then you build an organization that is capable of presenting new capability by composing what you got in new ways, uh, but not messing with the underlying OFPs in the individual components or the hardware. Uh, now you get the capability to, to deliver new capability or you have the opportunity to rapidly deliver new capability. And if the request for the capability is specifically coming from warfighters at the edge, then now you're taking advantage of the beauty of software, which is we can 
create software to solve a problem that may not be enduring. In other words, we may have a different problem tomorrow and that's okay because we have the organization and we have the process and we have the people who do that every single day and do that really, really well. So that to me is, while it's not perfect, the Spectrum Warfare Wing will not be everything to all people. Uh, I believe that we are as a service presenting a buy-in and setting the opportunity uh, presenting ourselves the opportunity to innovate, to grow, uh, to be able to get after that problem and not just talk about it. Hey, uh, Dollar, that's an awesome uh, uh, response. Uh, and I'm glad you jumped in there because it's not all negative. It's a, there's a lot of positive and you just highlighted some of it. And all of these are small steps. Uh, and I look forward to having you back and interviewing you when you're a four-star and the commander of the Air Force Information Warfare Major Command. Uh, you know, we, we, we've got to take small steps and uh, they are being taken. Um, all right, let's change the direction a little bit here. Here's one from Steve Burke. How can industry contribute to development and employment of a mixed reality, think uh, live virtual constructive synthetic environment for technology development uh, and operational training for MSO without offering adversary uh, collection opportunities? Is it within the distributed mission operations network? So I'll, I'll take a, a little piece of that one um, because I, I think that there's an interesting point that's worth unpacking in that. And that is, I, I think part of being in this uh, environment of competition uh, has to be that we're probably gonna have to um, begin to distance ourselves from this notion that we can develop a single wonder widget, think stealth atomic bomb, that's gonna offer us a long-term uh, competitive advantage. Uh, so uh, I think we're gonna have to accept the fact that sometimes we're gonna have to show our cards. Uh, but uh, if in doing that, we, our gain is greater than what we lose, uh, th then that might be something that we're willing, willing to risk. Of course, that always presupposes uh, the ability to have what I call grown-up conversations uh, between our senior most leaders, uh, data informed that lays it out on the table. We might elect to say, okay, um, we're going to show it. But even if we show you our playbook, there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Uh, and that needs to be our mindset. It won't always be the case, but I think we can't dismiss it outright. Over. Okay, very good. Um, here's one for you, uh, uh, Deke uh, Abba. Uh, does, this is from Ken Israel. Does software reprogramming happen to impact other weapons systems or is it unique to the F-35? Who is the lead for improving our overall software reprogramming capability? If we cannot reprogram at the speed of relevance, we'll always be behind the threat. Well, I'll let Dollar correct me to 100% on this, but this was something we spent an awful lot of time uh, working on in from the 53rd wing perspective. Uh, this is absolutely not unique to F-35, uh, but what's happening is rapid increases in complexity uh, over the years. When I made the F-15 example uh, before, Dollar can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about a handful of people required to do the electronic warfare reprogramming. Uh, it was a large, large leap when we went to F-22 with roughly 25 to 30 people involved in that. Uh, but uh, F-35, because of the complexity and the, the, the roughly 150,000 data fields involved in a mission data file, we're talking about, uh, you know, about 150 people uh, in the U.S. reprogramming lab down at, uh, at Eglin. So we're seeing an exponential growth in that, an increased reliance. Uh, so the Electronic Warfare Group at Eglon uh, had taken some steps uh, to try to reconcile and standardize the, the internal mechanization of the reprogramming enterprise so that every time we got a new mode of a surface-to-air missile out there, we were rebuilding it 25 or 30 different times, uh, but each weapon system could go in and extract uh, what was happening. So for the vast majority of Air Force assets and a significant number of international partners, it is the 53rd Electronic Warfare Group that is responsible for that uh, down at Eglin. Very good, anyone else want to, uh, Dollar, how'd he do? Uh, sir, he did awesome. Uh, he's a great, great boss. He, uh, he really is a great thinker for our Air Force. Uh, that's the guy, sir, that, uh, that'll be, that'll have the four stars and, and be the information warfare wing, or information warfare commander in the future. Well, uh, what I will say okay. is that, um, 
there is a unique, it, it actually builds upon things that were mentioned in by this panel, things like standards, interoperability, and architecture. Once you start deliberately building an architecture, what you give yourself the potential to do is now you don't have to have folks in every different squadron doing the same work. If you build a common integrated reprogramming platform that's accessible to all the folks doing the job, then now you can share that work. But sir, it goes even further. Imagine the potential of a common integrated reprogramming platform that services not only the Air Force, but the Navy and the Army. Now we could potentially port techniques across services but also potentially go even further. Imagine a common integrated reprogramming platform that allows us to share data and insights, the equivalent of apps across all of our joint teams, uh, uh, joint and coalition partners. So that, that's the future, that's the ability. So now the problem that I pose an adversary, they don't just have to worry about uh, a composite system of Air Force platforms. Now they've got to worry about platforms under the sea in space, on the surface, all of those, that's joint hall domain command and control. What I would uh, urge your, your viewers to do, if you haven't already taken a look at our, our former Chief Goldfiend's video at AFA from September of 2019, he shows a vignette of joint all domain command and control and, he, and how it can pose dilemmas to the adversaries. And he's got a bunch of lightning bolts combining things. That's the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's what we're talking about here. That is the potential of a sustainable, but again, affordable competitive advantage that I believe plays to the strength of free people. And that is our ability to take an ill-structured problem and think very, very creative about a capability that can address that problem and not have to go through a long drawn out acquisition process, but actually compose it right there at the edge and then go fight with it. And again, this afternoon, we're gonna bring something different. That's what we're talking about here, sir. That's the potential, all enabled by software. It's a beautiful thing. And I think we can compete and win there. So, hey, this is Dave Tramper. I want to chime in on that because that, that, that is all right on, that, that really that's where we want to be. That's the utopia that we want to get to. And, and I can tell you from my history with, with modular open uh, architectures and, and open standards is that one of the challenges that we have here and, and I, is, is our ability to work across the various programs and the PEOs to get them all consolidated and how we, how we move forward that together. And, and we see that, I, I see that in the Navy where, where we see EW systems are all over the place, right? They, they're in surface ships and they're in submarines and they're in, in tactical aircraft and, and all of those programs exist under different program executive offices. And so there, there is no linchpin there to say thou shalt use these standards, thou shalt use these architectures. I see the, I see the Army making great progress in, in how they, they apply their CMOS and, and uh, their victory standards to their systems. And so I talked to the Army and I said, how, how is it that you're making such good progress in your RF systems and your EW systems and applying, and applying these standards and getting them into your, your, your systems? And the answer was that those programs are being consolidated under a single PEO, right? So, so that they have that linchpin there that can say, I'm, you're going to use these standards and I'm going to pay attention to you making sure that you use these standards is really important. So, so when we talk about how do we govern uh, standardization and open architectures, if you go too high up in the, in the leadership uh, role and say, thou shalt govern it from here, I don't think you get as effective at an implementation as if you go down to the PEO level and say, we're going to put all of the, the EW or RF systems under this PEO. And this PEO is going to be responsible for implementing these standards and architectures. At that point, you have essentially the action officer level uh, uh, oversight on how those standards are being implemented. If you go too high, you don't get that clarity on what's going on, and there's a lot of maneuver space on, on how you use standards. And I, I will also point out that, that in some of my history with open architectures, we've had acquisition programs where we were working very closely with, and, and they, had, they were all in on using open standards, and, and they were going to apply them to their systems. And, and in the midst of delivering those capabilities, the program management changed in those acquisition programs and a new perspective came in. And there is risk within acquisition programs about 
uh, defining to industry what standards they shall use. And, and so the, that program management that came in or that rotated in was not willing to take that risk. And so all that hard work in creating the standards and building the systems and demonstrating the prototypes was essentially uh, fell apart because, because the new program management said, you know what, we're not going to take that risk. That, that GFI, that GFE risk that we take by telling industry what standards to use, we're not willing to do that. So we're going to ask industry to give us the open standard of choice. And, and I think all of us know what happens uh, when, when you do that, that there's, there's so much opportunity to say, yes, this is an open architecture. Here's the VITA standard I'm using. But when you dig in, you find that, oh, you know what, there's a pin here that's proprietary. And so despite the use of open and standard architectures, when I really dig in on the designs, I discover it's actually a proprietary system. So, so there's a lot of challenges in, in how we acquire systems and, and how we, how we, how we apply open and open standards and architectures. And as Dollar points out, that's, that's where we want to be. We want to be able to build a technique for a submarine that I can put in a ground vehicle or, or something that I can build for a tactical aircraft that's useful for a ship. I, I don't want to keep investing in the same technology and, and spending 95% of the budget because it's an integration problem, right? Uh, we really want to be able to port functionality across systems. Yeah, well, that's the whole point. Dave, and what Dollars was talking about was what some of us have been talking about for over a decade now, and that's building a combat cloud. Okay, you talked about JADC2. JADC2 is the command and control architecture that's necessary for controlling and taking actions inside that combat cloud, or whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, but I applaud your passion. Uh, uh, dollar and uh, part of what's missing, which gets to the organizational concerns and what has gotten us here today uh, in terms of, uh, you know, people are finally waking up and realizing the importance of everything that we're talking about, uh, EMSO, uh, but it's because there was no overarching organization uh, at a senior level. I'm not talking about somebody dictating solutions. I'm talking about leadership in the Department of Defense recognizing that we're in the information age now. We've passed the industrial age of warfare. So we're well past our closing time, but I wanted to let both Dave and, and Dollar speak there because they really made some excellent points. And again, I'd like to, to thank all of you. Uh, this, this finished up on a, on a great note. Uh, and so thanks for your contributions to each one of you and our audience from all of us here at Mitchell Institute. Uh, have a great aerospace power and IMSO kind of day. All right. Thanks very much, folks. Out here.